Hi, my name is Amanda Solomon and I'm the manager of museum and Holocaust education at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. And today I'm going to share with you our presentation based off of our temporary exhibition, Southern Rank. Southern Rights is a traveling photojournalism exhibition by Jillian, by, by Jillian Lau. The exhibition came about because of a young woman named Anna Rich. Anna grew up in the town of Mount Vernon, Georgia, and when she was 19 years old, she sent a letter to Spin Magazine, hoping someone would document the injustice that outraged her. The local high school's racially segregated spring prom and fall homecoming celebrations. And despite her numerous attempts to change things, including meetings with the school principal and other students, Anna's efforts were ignored or rejected. She hoped that bringing this information to a media outlet would raise more awareness and compel people to take action and demand that the proms become integrated. And I want to clarify for a moment what segregated homecoming and prom actually looked like in Mount Vernon. Yes, there was a white prom and a black prom, but how this unfolded was that all students, including white students, could attend the black prom, but black students could not attend the white prom. In more recent years, Mount Vernon also had become home to a significant population of, of Mexican and Mexican American students. Since they were not easily categorized by skin color, they were considered white and were allowed to attend both the black and white proms. When Jillian finally made it down to Mount Vernon in 2002, Anna had graduated, so her, so her sister Julie also in a also in a biracial relationship acted as her chaperone like her sister julie tried to integrate these social events in september 2005 after julie had also graduated the school held the last segregated homecoming the proms remained segregated until 2010. this exhibition challenges us to think about and discuss race and racism conversations that more often than not people actively try to avoid and i'm not saying talking about race or racism are easy or fun but in order for us to want to work for justice and equity it is important and necessary to recognize how past injustices and issues of inequity continue to manifest and impact our lives today. And before moving on, you may not agree with everything that I say during this presentation. And if you don't, that's okay. But I ask that you sit with what you don't agree with. Um, and if you need to pause, pause, but please continue watching until the end. So I just use terms like race and racism. So I think it's important that we're all on the same page and that we define them. So at the museum, we define race as a social construct that shapes relationships of power and privilege by arbitrarily granting degrees of worthiness to groups of people based on common ancestry or shared physical characteristics. And that is a long and wordy definition. So essentially what it's saying is that race is this made up idea that some people are inherently better or worse than others. And that shapes how we interact and view each other. Now, just because race is made up doesn't mean that racism isn't very real. So we define racism as a system of beliefs and actions based on the fictional idea of races that justifies unequal power. And I'd like to specifically note that we chose not to define the term racist. Aside from the fact that typically when someone is called a racist, their immediate reaction is defensive, saying something like, I'm not a racist, I'm a good person, or I'm not a racist, followed by some example of them trying to prove they aren't racist, but is really more problematic than helpful. Calling someone a racist is an easy way to stop a conversation. This idea that a racist must be a bad person makes it all too easy to place blame on others rather than look introspectively. And further, it's difficult to acknowledge our own racist actions or behaviors when we live within a racist society. 
this country was built upon racist principles that continue to shape our systems, institutions, and social interactions. And for some of us, me included, racism has been so normalized that sometimes it's difficult for us to recognize. And I'll come back to that point in just a few slides. But for now, before we begin looking at some of the photographs, one of the questions I'd like you to contemplate is, what do we do with the histories we inherit? We know that none of us were alive at the time of slavery, but we are still living in a country where injustice and inequity persist. The generations of enslaved people who were excluded from and denied opportunities has a lasting and continuing impact. The abolition of slavery in 1865 did not end racial inequality. Rather, it transformed it into other systems of oppression, such as Jim Crow laws, racial covenants, and voter suppression. Slavery's legacy is white supremacy, which is based on the belief that Black people are inferior to white people. It is, it is what it is what rationalized slavery for 250 years and has justified the discriminatory treatment of African Americans since. It has made segregated schools acceptable, mass incarceration possible, and police violence permissible. So I'll repeat that question again. What do we do with the histories we inherit? This exhibition exposes how one town continues to be impacted by the consequences of slavery and challenges us to reflect on how our own lives are entangled with this history and what our responsibility is to address the injustices moving forward. All right, so we have our first picture of Julie and Bubba in Mount Vernon, Georgia in 2002. I feel bad that Julie can't tell her parents about us. Since we've been together for a couple of years, I know she's not embarrassed. It's just hard for people of that generation to be okay with mixed couples here. Julie always comes to my place and is always welcome on this side of the tracks. She's just cool, not a color. Bubba, age 15, 2002. Bubba was my first love. We dated from eighth grade until my junior year of high school. Some friends started to tell me that they couldn't hang out with me anymore. That hurt because they were my friends since kindergarten. I didn't think they were bad people, just scared. Julie, age 17, 2005. So as I mentioned earlier, Anna Rich, who wrote the letter to Spin Magazine, had graduated high school by the time that Julian um, had made it down to Mount Vernon. So this was the picture of Julie, Anna's sister, and her boyfriend, Bubba, in 2002 during the segregated homecoming. Jillian interviewed every person that she photographed um, and the captions that I just read and as you'll see in the photos to come are direct quotes from those conversations. What I find interesting when I read the two statements is that unlike Bubba, Julie calls out her friends and doesn't simply place the existence and continuation of racism on her parents or grandparents. She calls out her peers for being scared, but scared of what? Scared of their parents' reaction? Scared of being judged? Scared of change? Scared because in their life, the system, the one built on racial oppression and inequality benefits them and they don't want it to change? Scared of what would happen if people of color had equal access to the same opportunities as them? I'm not sure what they are scared of, but to me, Julie's statement acknowledges that fear contributes to, to the preservation of racial inequality. And with that thought in mind, I want to share this quote with you. The opposite of racist isn't not racist, it's anti-racist. What's the difference? One endorses either the idea of a racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist or locates the roots of problems in power and policies as an anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. 
there is no in-between safe space of not racist. That's by Ibram X. Kendi. And so we're going to define anti-racist as a person who actively tries to identify and eliminate racial inequalities. So what stands out in this quote for you? What questions does it raise? For me, I think about how I was taught that as long as a person didn't say the N-word or that they weren't part of a white supremacist group, such as the KKK, that they weren't racist. I was taught racists were bad people, mean people, people not like me. I never considered how my inactions to confront racism and, and racial inequalities makes me complicit. It makes me reconsider how I'm one of the millions of ordinary, not racist people upholding the racial hierarchy our nation was found and built upon. It really forces me to think beyond my personal bubble and contemplate my complacency for a system that benefits me, but is also so discriminatory and unjust to others. It's kind of like that saying that if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. All right, I want you to take a moment and observe the photos that are on your screen. What do you first notice? What are your thoughts? We're gonna take a closer look at each photo, um, at, at each photo, but I want you to keep the quote that I just read in mind and think about what does it look like, sound like, feel like to be an anti-racist. All right, this is a photo of Shelby on her grandmother's car in Mount Vernon, Georgia in 2008. If I want to, sh to show the rebel flag, I'm going to because that's my heritage. All these people who run around screaming that the Confederate flag is racist, they're not stupid, they are ignorant because ignorance is the absence of really knowing what happened. I'm not going to hide it from nobody. Shelby, age 16, 2008. The crazy guy who killed people in South, in South Carolina was insane, not racist. People keep saying that because he posted the Confederate flag on Facebook, the shooting was a racist act. That's so ignorant of them. It's stupid that people are getting hysterical over the Confederate flag. I will continue to wear my clothes with it. To me, it, it symbolizes my Southern heritage. The Civil War was about much more than slavery. Shelby, age 24, 2016. Take a moment to reflect on how you're feeling right now. Are you angry, confused, sad, frustrated, intrigued, something else? Why are you feeling that way? What questions would you want to ask Shelby? The part of Shelby's comments that raise some questions for me is when she says, to me, it symbolizes my Southern heritage. My first questions to her would be, what does heritage mean to you? And what exactly about your Southern heritage does the flag symbolize? I think it's really important to be curious rather than judgmental when having when having potentially difficult and contentious conversations. To me, heritage is history, traditions, or practices that are passed down. But including history as heritage is complicated. History isn't just the past, it's what we choose to remember about the past. And since every person is different, it's natural that they remember things differently. This is not to say that we have to agree with or dignify the history every person remembers. Rather, rather that we have, to, we have to recognize that history is made up of a spectrum of memories, some more exaggerated and more distorted than others. Therefore, I'd also wanna ask Shelby, have you considered how the Confederate flag means something else, something offensive to other people? For African Americans and many others, the Confederate flag stood for and continues to symbolize slavery, oppression, and white supremacy. This, this heritage, this history of dehumanization and enslavement with the Confederacy is not something that should be overlooked or disregarded. 
Shelby does not consider herself a racist, nor does she consider the, the Confederate flag a racist symbol, but many people would disagree with that. After talking to Shelby about what flags stand for, I'd also like to ask her, does it matter to you that the Confederate flag has found popularity among white supremacist and white nationalist groups? When we look at, at symbols, sometimes we need to be critical at what they mean or how they are used in their present context. Since white supremacists and white nationalists are using the Confederate flag to rally around hate and violence today, then maybe this is something she should consider. This is a photo of Harley getting ready for the white prom um, in the Cutting Up Tanning and Hair Salon in Vidalia, Georgia in 2008. It's always been segregated. There's always been two separate proms. It doesn't seem like a big deal around here. It's just what we know and what our parents have done for so many years. It's not about being racist. We're in the same classes, we eat lunch together and sit at the same tables. It's not about what color you are, it's about your attitude, how you present yourself and how you take care of yourself. It's not about if you're black or white. Harley, age 17, 2009. Remember what I said about racism being so normalized that sometimes it's really difficult for us to, to recognize it? Well, this is a perfect example. From Harley's perspective, segregation isn't racist, it's normal. Harley's comments make me think about more, or Harley's comments make me think more about what it means to be an anti-racist, a person who actively tries to identify and eliminate racial inequalities. Right now, Harley, Harley benefits from the, the way things are in Mount Vernon. She's not the one being excluded from social, from social celebrations. Her Black classmates are. And Harley's statements that it's always been that way shows that she's content with the with the segregated prom and doesn't see a reason or need for it to change. But just because something has always been a certain way doesn't mean it's right or that it shouldn't change. The reasoning that something shouldn't change because it's always been that way is used by the people who benefit from the way things are. Take voting rights, for example. Throughout history, many Americans have been and continue to be excluded from voting. It took both the, the disenfranchised and their allies to organize and rally for reform. It took people who thought the way it's always been isn't right or fair, and I want to change it. One of the questions we like to ask at the museum is, when does somebody else's fight become your fight? I would love to ask Harley that question and see how she responds, because I'm not sure she's really ever thought about that before. Some other questions that I'd like to ask Harley are, do you know the history of why there are two separate proms? Can you explain what you meant by, it doesn't seem like a big deal around here? Do you think all of the students in the school feel that way? Does it seem fair that the white students can go to the black prom, but the black students can't go to the white prom? I'd be really curious to know her responses. The heartbeat of anti-racism is self-reflection, recognition, admission, and fundamentally self-critique. While a racist when charged with racism will say, I'm not a racist, no matter what this, they, they said or did, an anti-racist would be willing to confess and recognize what they just said or did was in fact racist. It's also by Ibram X. Kenti. I love this quote because it starts to explain what it takes to be anti-racist. And no shocker, being anti-racist is hard. It takes patience, practice, courage, and vulnerability. So for the next four photographs, we would usually split your tour group into smaller groups to have each group look at the photos, read the captions, and then talk about some of the questions that we posed. So instead, I'm gonna share some of those questions with you and the responses that they provoked. 
so this is a photo of Sierra and Kent outside of the Black Prom in Mount Vernon, Georgia in 2008. I've been with Kent for two years, but I couldn't take him to the white folks prom a couple of weeks ago, so I went alone. I'm allowed to go with him to the black prom though, which is way more fun anyway. What pissed me off is that all the teachers who are mostly white showed up for the white prom to take photos of their students, but I haven't seen one of them show up at the black prom for the rest of their students. Sierra, age 17, 2008. Racism is always going to be an issue around here, but things have gotten better. In high school, when people found out I was in an, interrelation, an, an interracial relationship, my family especially, they were not accepting. They called me an end lover. I can't even say that word. Now they've become much more open and, accept, and accepting, so that's a big deal. Sierra, age 25, 2016. Sierra's comments are both heartbreaking and promising. In 2008, she mentions that the teacher showed up to the white prom, but not the black prom. This type of treatment demonstrates that separate proms are not equal. On one tour, this led to a discussion of how the black students might have felt betrayed and let down, knowing that the adults, their teachers, the ones that are supposed to support their students and stand up for them when things are unfair, didn't. In 2016, Sierra reflects on how her family has become more accepting over the years. She doesn't mention what has caused them to change their minds, but it makes me feel hopeful that when people get to know someone on a personal level, it can challenge their preconceived ideas about groups of people and change how they view and treat others. Have you ever met someone from a different background that changed your perspective? Before I read the captions for this photo, I just want to say that I love how in this photograph, um, it makes me feel like Angel is staring right at me, trying to capture my attention. What do you feel when you look at the photo? Last night, we went to see all our friends at the senior walk, and after the father-daughter dance, all the Black kids were asked to leave. Yeah, that was upsetting. I'm worried to talk about it because I don't want to jeopardize my future here. We moved here because my dad got the assistant principal job at the middle school. He was a very active member of the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People chapter here. But then he got discouraged. I think this job has depended on him keeping quiet. I've heard it being said that it's a white person's game and you just have to learn to play it. Angel, age 17, 2009. This community has recently come together, and it seems like, however small, that, that the changes are happening. I'm a seventh grade teacher and also a pre-med student by night, really trying to get the most out of this life. I feel proud that one day I can tell my children that I helped make a change by using my voice. If my friends and I didn't speak out, there's a good chance that the proms would still be segregated. Angel, age 24, 2016. So to give a little bit of background to Angel's statements, in 2009, the New York Times Magazine commissioned Jillian to make a photo essay and multimedia piece about the segregated proms. Angel, along with some of her peers, asked Jillian to wait until after graduation to publish the article. And from the photograph, Angel appears strong, fierce, and determined. Yet she talks about being scared of her future, of being allowed to graduate, if she speaks up. Therefore, one of the questions Angel's comments raises is what opportunities or obstacles do different people face when engaging in activism? I mean, when you think about it, age, skin tone, ethnicity, gender, how much money you have, where you live, language, immigration status, just to name a few, influence, how a person involves themselves with addressing injustices and making changes. For Angel, saying it, it's a white person's game and you just have to learn to play it shows that for her skin tone played a major role. I also think it's really important to mention that it didn't stop her from participating in change. In fact, it's something that in 2016, she's still really proud of. 
Instead, it just altered the way in which she went about it. The, the New York Times Magazine uh, piece was published on May 21st, 2009, the day after graduation. It sparked a national outrage and within days, a town meeting convened and local parents made the, the decision to have an integrated prom the following year. Quanti's photo and statements get me every time because we can genuinely hear how his life has been impacted by the concept of race and racism. So this is a picture of Quantiana's cousin's car in Lyons, Georgia in 2011. I am from Mount Vernon, the side of the train tracks where the black folks live. I live with my mom, my grandma, and my sister Sahara. They make me go to church with them on Sundays, but I told them I won't be able to make it this Sunday after prom. When I graduate, I want to go to the military so I can see the world and meet people. Quanti, age 16, 2011. I pay, play basketball a few times a week, but the park on our side of town was closed while I was gone in the military. Now we have to use the court on the other side of town where most of the white folks live, and it's, and it's much nicer. They have tennis courts, a playground, and skateboarding ramps. But I make sure not to stay when it gets dark because, I'm, because I start getting looks from people like I'm gonna do something. Quanti, age 21, 2016. Aside from white and black residents of Mount Vernon living on opposite sides of the tracks, Quanti's story tells us about the inequity between the two communities. Now that the park has been closed on the black side of town, he's forced to travel to the white side of town and play on their courts, where it's much nicer. Quanti's words make me question how else does he experience inequity because of race? And I want to reread Quanti's last sentence from 2016. But I make sure not to stay when it gets dark because I start getting looks from people like I'm going to do something. Sit with that for a moment. Two of the questions we have students discuss for this photograph is, how do people know they are safe and welcome in a space? And why does Quanti not feel safe in the white neighborhood? Quanti's awareness of how some white, white, white residents of Mount Vernon assume that just because he's black, he's dangerous, makes me feel sad and angry. Sad that in reality, he's the one who's not safe and is forced to take precautions and leave, and leave the courts on the white side of town before dark. And angry because, well, this isn't right or fair that he's judged based on his skin tone. So Quanti really makes me reflect on how do I judge people based on how they look? And what do I do to make people feel safe and welcome? This is our last photo of Quan in Brook in Mount Vernon, Georgia in 2012. Two years back, me and Brooke would never be able to go to prom together. It's cool to be the first biracial couple to go to prom together, but I think I'd still be scared to date most of the white girls in town because of their parents. Quan, age 17, 2012. Just the other day, Brooke picked me up to get something to eat and we got pulled over for no reason. The cop barely said anything to her, but he pulled me out of the car and threw me, and threw me against it very hard. I don't know what he was looking for, but he was nasty and it took all of my strength to hold my tongue. He kept provoking me. I knew that all he wanted was some reason to arrest me, but I tried to stay calm and give him no reason. It almost seems like cops have gotten more, more aggressive around here, even though you'd think the opposite would happen after all the incidents that were recorded this past year. Quan, age 21, 2016. What are three words or phrases that come to your mind after reading the captions and looking at the photo? For me, it's progress, unchanged, and reflective. The first two, progress and unchanged, seem, seem contradictory, but Quan's experiences show us that, that things can progress in one area, such as the proms becoming integrated, but not change or even worsen in, in another, 
such as his being harassed and provoked by the police officer. I do not know why the police officer pulled Brooke over and it seems that Quan doesn't know either. But the fact that the officer barely said anything to Brooke and was aggressive and nasty towards Quan makes me think race has something to do with it. I chose reflective as my third word because I'd like to end this virtual tour slash presentation with some questions for you to think about. These photos share a story of how one small town in Georgia has been and continues to be affected by race and racism. So I'm going to ask you, how does the story connect to Oregon? How has and is your life or community affected by race and racism? What have you done to disrupt racism or discrimination? And what can you do to be an anti-racist? And finally, who can you call on to help you raise awareness about an injustice? And I'd like to end with uh, one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I'd like to thank you for taking this virtual tour presentation of Southern Rights with me. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us at education at ojmche.org. Thank you.